Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, being here. Here, uh, as I say always, when I come back, I, I come back home. It's not just a place where I've been a fellow. It's home. It's obviously a great place to succeed. But my experience here was that it's also a place where you find people to support and to encourage you when you fail. And we all obviously fail all the time. So uh, fellows who are now fellow at Carnegie, if that happens to you, you're in good hands. So enjoy the time you have, the freedom you have here. It's probably, it was the best uh, years of my life. So I will um, provide you some uh, context about how I see my work on Earth, but in the planetary context. So I will start with this. Then I will give you some hints about the work I've been doing, on, doing over the last four or five years, trying to understand the inner workings of the carbon cycle through modeling and experiments. And I will finish the presentation, if I can reach that time, uh, with some actual project that I'm working on right now in the lab. So as you can see, we will speak about reactivity. We will speak about chemical reactions. We will speak about carbon. But breathing means oxygen, right? So we will also speak about the link between oxygen, carbon, and water cycle. But before I get to this, I wanted to start with some uh, funny statement. It was published in 2014. Apparently, we are very close to finding another Earth. And I kind of laughed about it for two reasons. The first is because I had in mind this image. So that's the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, is that what we're looking for? I mean, we didn't prove pretty ab habile, right, to manage the only habitable planet that we know of. So that was the first thing I, was, I thought about. And the second one is, well, we actually don't even know what Earth is. And I put here the title of, of a book that was published in the early 20th century by um, uh, Schrodinger, What is Life? At the time, it was very people realized that it was tough to define, right? We don't know what life is. Well, what I think is that probably the time now is to ask the same question for Earth. What is Earth? What defines it? What makes it unique and actually worthy of protection? So I actually published two uh, uh, small uh, reflections, essays, one entitled What is Earth and the other one Finding Earth. What are we looking for? And obviously, um, I didn't stop there, and I decided to ask, as uh, Doug said, I decided to ask a wide range of scientists, intellectuals, what would be their take on this question? And that's, be careful, that's the most interesting part of the talk. Maybe I should stop there. So the astronomer, Xavier Dumusque, maybe you know him, he said, Earth is a sinusoidal signal in velocity with a period of a year and amplitude of 10 centimeters per second. So I guess some of you we'll see, we'll recognize uh, uh, what it means. An atomic physicist said an astronomical body whose surface amazingly seemed to contain almost every atom from the periodic table. So the geochemist among you will, uh, will be familiar with this. A thermodynamicist, I really find it funny. Earth is a, is a dissipative system sustained by the energy entropy flow between the hot sun and our cold universe, a sheer unbelievable manifestation of thermal non-equilibrium processes that in their richness and complexity sometimes seem to defy the laws of physics. Pretty long sentence. Higgs freak Tevang Yu, so he's actually, what, he works on Higgs uh, boson. He said Earth is a local over density in a homogeneous and isotropic universe resulting from a chain of gravitational collapse over billions of years that ultimately originated in a stretch out quantum fluctuations imprinted in the primordial soup. It's actually tough to say, but so. Uh, an evolutionary plant biologist say it's home for the evolution of life for more than three billion years. And finally, an ethicist say it's a place where human freedom leads us to wonder at the laws of physics and biology while asking why. And believe me, there are many more. So this is just a selection. So what we get from this is that the definitely, it is definitely complex to define. It's maybe a bit of this and a little bit of all of this. So what do we do as geoscientists? What is our take, actually, on this question? Well, I think it's characterizing the planet in search for distinctive traits. We actually go in every corner of the planet, and we try to find what makes it unique. 
So I have listed here three important questions in my opinion. What controls the periodic oscillations of climate over decades to millions of years? How do we interpret planetary signatures? If you give me a chemical signal from a, an atmosphere, what does it mean in terms of planetary processes, inner and at the surface? How do atmospheric signatures evolve over time? What controls them? Could the structure and rhythms of our planet be unique in the solar system? These are the type of questions which I think define us as geologists and that make us part of the big discussion about looking for other habitable planets. Two characteristics which I think make Earth increasingly difficult to define and why the question is actually worthy. Ch the Earth changes over time. Actually, there are many Earths. There's not one single Earth. And it's kind of alive because the Earth was a, co a, a, a product of life, indirectly and directly. And both properties, the fact that it changes and the fact that it has been sculpted by life, are linked to the carbon cycle. It controls climate, it controls biospheric evolution, and it controls, obviously, and it's linked to geological evolution. So this is kind of a primer on the carbon cycle, and we used to start with processes with fluxes. I want to start where, with where is the carbon, and you will see it's kind of surprising. Nowadays, we focus a lot on the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's kind of the focal point for the society. We want to know how CO2 fluctuates, whether we have a future on this planet. Actually, what defines Earth is not that the CO2 is in the atmosphere, is the extraordinary capacity of the planet to store CO2 in rocks. That's what makes Earth absolutely unique, in my opinion, compared to Venus, for example, where the, the greenhouse is huge. All the carbon is in the atmosphere. So our, rock, our Earth, maybe, is defined by the fact that it has an ability to store carbon in rocks. And it's actually make, this is what makes it uh, changing, because the atmospheric reservoir is so uh, small, 60, 600 gigaton, the size of this reservoir makes it sensitive to perturbation in flux between the endogenic and the exogenic reservoir. If it would be a huge buffered reservoir, there would be no fluctuations, right? So climate cyclicity is actually linked to this property of the planet to store carbon in rock, and it allows it to have a, a, a clement climate. So most of the carbon in the planet is in the solid, uh, in its solid part. Just a small fraction is in the atmosphere, and this is the crux of all the questions for the society and probably for science as well. Because of that, those exchanges, because the planet changes, it's dynamic, we have continuous exchanges of carbon between the biosphere, atmosphere, lithosphere since more than three billion years. And this is this longevity of the carbon cycle is a very critical question, and I think we have not addressed it enough. The fact that it has gone for so long, why? So I will come back to this later. So I call it, the, the fact that Earth has changed, I call it the many Earth problem. There, there's not a single Earth. Actually, for geologists, we are familiar with the traditional distinction of the, the different eras. So you have the eon, the Archean eon, the Proterozoic eon, Phanerozoic eon. Well, for the geologists among you, you should know that biologists now ha are defining other type of eons based on uh, evolutionary uh, biology. There's a period in the beginning which is now called biological innovation. So this is the first evolutionary eon. The second is called more biological adaptations. So you, you form all the, all the, 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 the machines, the nanomachines of life, and then you just recycle them. You just shuffle them uh, via different processes. So the Earth, because of this coevolution between the biosphere, the solid Earth, has uh, different periods that we can define, and there are actually many different Earths. And because of these exchanges, we can also, uh, uh, the manifestation of these exchanges is the cyclicity of climate and some actually major perturbations. So in the end of the Archean, beginning of Phanerozoic, there were some major carbon cycle perturbations linked as well to exchanges between geosphere and biosphere. In the end of the ne Neoproterozoic, also major glaciations and carbon cycle perturbations due to these exchanges. And to a, at a smaller scale, in the Eocene, there was what 
we call the climatic uh, 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 optimum of the Eocene, which is also linked to some interaction between climate, biosphere, geodynamic, probably linked to India, uh, drift to Asia. So the carbon cycle is really at the center of what the research about what Earth is, but it's also at the center about some curious manifestation uh, 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 period of Earth's history. So I, I've been fascinated by the carbon cycle through all my career, and I think I have not ex exhausted my passion for it. So there's, there's a lot of questions that remain, and I will try to show you what we understand, but also mostly what we don't understand. So this is the, what I call the pedag pedagogical view of the carbon cycle, and I will explain you why. But if, you, if, if I have to define a carbon cycle, I would say that it is, um, it is re it's a structure that emerges from microscopic processes in, the, in life, in rocks, in various surface and deep reservoirs. And uh, it's a macroscopic structure that emerges from these micro microscopic processes. Fluxes link various reservoirs, the solid earth, the, the atmosphere, the ocean, the biosphere. And the carbon cycle is also making bridges between the inorganic world, carbonates, for example, CO2 in the atmosphere, and the organic world. So you will see some bridges between the two worlds. So this is a pedagogical presentation. Why? Because if you see for the flux here, subduction zones where you have carbon uh, that sink from the surface to the mantle of the Earth, and volcanism metamorphism, which returns carbon to the surface, this is a feedback, basically, that regulates the size of the surface reservoir. Look at the numbers here. They are equal. Obviously, you show this as students. They think that we know that it's equilibrated. Well, this is purely pedagogical because the teacher, when he shows this figure, he wants to be able to come back in one million years and still teach the same slides, right? So he will put the same number because he wants to be intellectually satisfied, right? But actually, this is a question. We have no clue. We have no clue if this is equilibrated. So this is the first topic I will talk about today. What do we know about the balance of flux between the, the flux of carbon from the surface to the deep earth and the flux that comes out through volcanism? So in, in, my, in my research about the, on the carbon cycle, it's linked to the water cycle. I try to understand how microscopic processes control microscopic dynamic of the carbon cycle, so to bridge the scales. As a geological target, I'm trying to assess how the crust and continents react, whether from the surface to depth. So I don't really want to focus on deep earth, on surface. I take the lithosphere as a reactive system, and I want to understand how it reacts and how it controls atmospheric signatures. And as a strategy, I actually didn't focus on carbon itself. I wanted to focus on the mediator of the transfer, which is water. Water is the solvent. And I decided to shift gear and to actually focus for a few years on water and trying to better understand it as a link between processes at the surface and in the deep earth. And so now we will dig into this. So this is a, 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 um, a scheme of a subduction zone. So you have a slab that is uh, sinking in the mantle of the Earth. You have continents. You have sediments here. The atmosphere containing CO2 and oxygen. And you can incorporate carbon to the lithosphere. As plates sink, they carry this carbon to depths. Various transformation happen. The carbon can be released from the slab, come back, react along the way, be released at the surface. And that's what we call the subduction zone carbon cycle. It's actually very complex, and I'm asking, is it an abyss of complexity? As geologists, it feels that way, because there are so many processes, so many interactions between oxidized carbon, reduced carbon, link with fluids, link with minerals. And our job is to actually unpack all of this, try to understand all of these processes. In terms of climate, the climate thing back is basically an exchange between a reaction, this reaction of silicate weathering which is storing carbon from the atmosphere in rocks, which is balanced by decarbonation in subduction zones, so release of carbon from rocks through this reaction, which is, we call it the, the, the decarbonation reaction. It's actually a model 
but it's a model, it's a reaction that releases carbon. So over millions of years time scales, climate is regulated by the balance between those two uh, type of reactions. And so I will give you a bit more insight about how that works. But before this, I was asking whether this is an abyss of complexity. Well, some people have thought that we can reduce that. So we can take all of this complexity and in climate model, in long-term cli climate models, the subduction zone is basically a, a Greek letter. It's called sigma, okay? This is the subduction efficiency. It is basically the amount of carbon that comes out from subductions from the slabs at shallow depths. So it means that it comes back fast. Everything that goes um, deeper in the mantle is not considered. So this is a very basic box model, typical. This is really the architecture of all long-term climate models. Exchange between different reservoirs, the fluid sphere, continental carbonates, deep ocean carbonates. You have fluxes that link all of them, different parameters. Sigma is what appears always. So in the geoclim, for example, uh, model, or Jenny, or others, other type of models, there's one parameter for this entire range of processes. So for us, this is not satisfactory. What controls it? My question was, so over the last years, it was what controls this subduction efficiency? That, and does it change over time? Is it even a parameter? Because it's considered as a parameter, and in long-term climate model, we run models over hundreds of millions of years with one parameter, and it's actually 0.6, so they consider 0.6. Is it a, even a parameter? Is it not a variable? How does it vary over space? over time. So it was one of the motivation of my, my, my work, starting from Karn, uh, here until uh, and, um, even in Switzerland for a few years. So the first approach to get this subduction efficiency is to actually measure. So it's an ex situ approach, empirical. You basically take all the deep drilling in the deep oceans. You measure how much carbon there is. You know the input. And then you go to volcanoes. You measure the fluxes that come out. You make the difference between this, and you call it the subduction efficiency. You plug it in the climate model. So that's the ex situ uh, budget, and there have been a few proposed. It's, it varies quite a lot, but since the, even the 70s, you have papers. They already use that number, and they take, it's always between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 in those climate models. Well, again, if you want to focus on the drivers and be able to predict or to reconstruct in the past, you need to know the the driving factors, you need to know the, the controls. And so that's the more the ab initio approach or to try to know what drives those, what drives those flux out of slab and can we predict it. And the, the major question is what is the behavior of carbonates? That's a, whether you consider Earth or any other planet, carbonate is a major carbon bearing mineral. We need to understand his behavior at high temperature and pressure. There are many regimes of carbonate solubility in fluids. The first one is a congruent dissolution. So it means that if you put a, a carbonate mineral with water, it will dissolve and every uh, element it is composed of will go in the fluid. There are experiments that have been done. You have here the solubility uh, of the carbonate at different temperatures, different pressure. You can see that above a certain pressure, which is three kilobar, the solubility of carbonates increases. So if you have a slab that goes deep, temperature increase, the solubility of the carbonate increases. There are experiments at very high pressure, and there have been a body of work that have tried to constrain the solubility of carbonate. This is called the congruent dissolution, okay? But what is actually critical is that carbon is not driven by the behavior of water alone. It's actually linked to other elements which, have, which are not volatile, like quartz, like silica. Actually, this reaction fundamentally is an incongruent dissolution. Quartz plus calcite gives wollastonite plus CO2. There are some very fundamental insights to, to see in this reaction. The first one is that the solubility of the carbonate, the, 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 the release of CO2, does not depend on the property of water. It depends on the property of the calc silicate that is formed. So it is actually the stability of the calc silicate that will, that will determine how much CO2 uh, is released. Here you have a diagram showing the temperature, the mole fraction of CO2 in water for this type of reaction. 
On the right side, you have calcite plus quartz. On, the, uh, on this side of the, of, of the uh, solubility line, you have the wollastonite plus CO2. The experiments show that as you increase the temperature, you have a very sharp increase of the solubility of carbon in the fluid. And this is not driven by water property. It is driven by the fact that wollastonite becomes extremely stable at high temperature in those conditions. So this is the first important thing. So if you put carbonate plus in a, in a mineralogical environment, it will completely change its behavior. So it's very important to know that the carbon cycle cannot be isolated. We cannot study carbon in isolation of its context. The second very critical insight is that this reaction, even though we write it without water, it actually does not exist on Earth. You will never find this reaction on Earth without water. This reaction is all the time driven by water. Water is the solvent for the minerals and the catalyst. So it allows the water to, the, the, the minerals to dissolve, to react. So in those experiments, if we plot a mole fraction of CO2 in the water, it's the, the fluid is actually loaded with calcium, loaded, loaded with silica. And this is why I prefer to call this reaction an incongruent dissolution. Decarbonation gives the impression that there's just carbon involved and water. There's much more. Silica is critical. And there's one more step to do here. So there's a link between carbon and silica, and it doesn't need to be only through minerals. Take this reaction, for example, where you form epidotes. So now it's just a little bit more complicated. You, form, you have aluminum in the system. You can actually decarbonate your rock without having quartz present. You can just flow water charged with silica and alumina and decarbonate your rock. So even though the, the decarbonation reaction usually has been described as reacting different minerals, it can actually be driven by flowing fluids. And how do we know that fluids in, at high temperature in the crust carry those elements, silica and alumina in particular? It's because we have found metamorphic veins charged with quartz, kyanite, different types of minerals that are rich in aluminum and silica. So the point here is to remember that there is a codependence of volatile and metal cycles on Earth and on any planet. We cannot isolate the study of the carbon cycle from any other element cycles, but there are some that are more important. And in what I propose here is that the silica and the alumina cycles are extremely important. And here I have images showing you epidotes, the green, garnets, which are all behaving as calcium traps. Okay, wollastonite, in terms of carbon cycling, this is a calcium trap. Here, epidote can serve as a ca calcium trap. Garnet can serve as a calcium trap. So as a carbon cycle specialist, when you look at a rock, look for the calcium trap. There are many of them in, the, in, the, in nature, and it's actually fascinating. One reason we have all this diversity, not only at the surface geochemistry, but also deep earth geochemistry, is because of water. And we have spoken about this. Water is a polar molecule. It's actually the geometry of the water molecule. It's, it's a, it forms a kink. So it has a dipole moment. And it is a corrosive molecule. It can corrode rocks at the surface and deep in the earth. Because of that property, it re re redistributes critical elements like silica, alumina, carbon, calcium, etc. All of this needs to be introduced in models if we want to understand the carbon cycle. And until 2015-16, there was no way to do this in, in classical petrological model that we used to do carbon cycling prediction. Now it has changed. Here you have a, a diagram, pressure temperature, with density, uh, iso density here in black. And in blue, you have the dielectric constant of, the, of water. The dielectric constant is basically the, 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 the average dipole moment of the water molecule. So if the dielectric constant is high, which is a high pressure here and low temperature, water will tend to dissolve elements in forms of ions. If the dielectric constant is low, like at high temperature and, and at high temperature and low pressure, it will still dissolve elements, but in forms of complexes that are neutral, not charged. It's very important because it's all the time the same molecule, right? It doesn't change. It's still the same kink, it's still the same atoms. But the, physically, this is a completely different object. It does not behave the same way. 
And why it matters for planetologists, for example, is because you can distinct, distinguish different regimes there. It is basically a napolar solvent in hot subduction zone or maybe in giant telluric planet. Water will behave as a nearly apolar solvent. Conversely, it is a polar solvent, very, very polar, in, in cold subduction zones where pressure rises fast. Or in small telluric planet, you can expect that you have different regimes of water-rock interaction because of these changes in the property of the water molecule. One of our goal was to link this physical property of water with classical models of uh, petrological uh, evolution over the last basically four years. And the goal was to describe the codependence of metal volatile fluxes at high temperature pressure. That was my goal. So I wanted to see how the carbon cycles is linked to metal cycles, not just to water. So the goal was to clarify the fundamental mechanisms of this, fund of this codependence and also to build predictive petrological models of volatile, non-volatile transport to inform climatic models, to, to understand how the lithosphere reacts and how it controls atmospheric signature. So here I list a few papers that uh, result from uh, those kind of work. I will go quickly on, on, the, on the technicalities. This is a type of phase diagram that we have done for, for decades in petrology, trying to describe phase assemblages of minerals at different pressure temperature. So here the different fields represent different assemblages of minerals. In blue, this is the amount of mineral in the rock that we simulate here. To generate this, we minimize the energy of the system so we know what is the stable uh, uh, minerals and we know how much water is in it. But as we said, water changes. It's not always the same physical uh, object. And this is something that we did not have access before. What we have done here is to use the classical model, but to improve it with some uh, uh, um, elements of physics for the water molecule. So, and this is done very easily through this type of hydroxyl uh, 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 equilibria, which involves oxides. They compose the minerals in the system you're interested in, like sediments that go in subduction. It involves ions, which can be dissolved in the fluid, and obviously it involves water. If you uh, write this type of re reaction, if you want to know the proportion of elements, how they will split between the two sides, you need standard state properties for oxides, for uh, electrolytes, and for water. You get this from databases. We have standard state properties of minerals and uh, solid solution, which are pretty uh, elaborate. So this is what we have in our model. We have data about dielectric constant of water and standard state chemical property of uh, standard state chemical potential of solutes. So this is the HKF model or renamed DO model recently. We need a charge balance, obviously, when you start having ions in a fluid. And we need a way to minimize, to find the, the, the minimum uh, energy of the system. And uh, we have an algorithm to do this, which is called Gibbs energy minimization. So that's the most technical part of the talk. So that's what we have done, and I was at Carnegie at the time. What I've done over the last year, so this is like a snapshot. I can, we can simulate an equilibrium between fluids and minerals at high pressure temperature, but there's no dynamic there. There's no transport. It's just predicting, and it was already an important result. But what I've done when I started, when I arrived at ETH, is to work with a postdoc who was extremely interested in programming, and he wanted to put some dynamic in it. He wanted to actually simulate a subduction zone, a slab, where you have very different layers of rocks, all connected by flowing fluids, and to be able to do this type of measurement, this type of prediction of element transport, not just carbon, but silica, alumina transport, and to put all of this in a model to predict how much carbon gets out of the slab. So as input to this type of dynamic model, we, we need the thermal structure of the sub subduction zone. We have that from Syracuse et al. We need a compositional structure for the slab. We have sediments, basalts, gabbro, uh, mantle rocks. All of that is uh, in the input. We need to define plate kinematics, convergence rate, for example, for different subduction zones. And we need a transport model for H2O, which at that moment is the most simple. It is basically as soon as 
our phase diagram says that water is released, we transport it to the cell just above. And so we make it react with the rock and we get it out of the slab. So we transport the water, the water dissolves the rock according to the laws of thermodynamics, and then we just count and we measure how much carbon comes out. Our goal is to give you an ab initio prediction of the subduction efficiency and to give this to climate models. The first thing we did with our model was to test it and to see whether at least the flux of water that we predict is consistent with observations in slabs. So we have taken this map, resistivity map of McGarry in the Cascadia. We have made, we have simulated the slab and in blue here, we, you have the peak of water released from the slab. And we were super interested because we found that we have actually an excellent match between the, the anomaly in resistivity in the Cascadia and the pulse of water released from our slab based on purely petrological model. So we thought it would be at least in terms of qualitative uh, prediction, a very good basis to now try to quantify carbon. So here we just count water, but obviously the water carried a lot of elements. So now we can see what we get. The other test we did, obviously we didn't want to predict just carbon re release through sample decarbonation. We wanted to predict this reaction, carbon release because silica is flowing in the system, not as a mineral, but as a, as a solute. We tested our, our model against experimental data about silica solubility and alumina solubility. In black is our uh, prediction. You can see that it's pretty good until 500, 550, but it gets pretty wild at higher temperature. For alumina, it's a little bit better, but we still have troubles. We can speak about this. It's linked to some uh, interesting phenomena at high temperature, close to uh, a partial melting of the rock. It's not perfect. There's still a lot of work, experiments needed, a calibration. But what was absolutely fundamental is that for the first time, our fluid transport silica and alumina, and we can predict this type of reaction. So far, we had no way to do this. The only thing we were transporting was carbon and water. Now we can transport all of this and we can simulate this. So we wanted to apply, and here is the result globally. So we took all the different subduction zones, all the, of the different composition of sediments of rocks. We ran the model with different inputs. This is the result for each individual subsystem. So you have all the subduction zones and you have basically the amount of carbon that comes out of the slab at different, in different regions. In black, it's carbon that comes out of our simulated slab before the arcs. You can see that in Mexico, for example, a lot of carbon comes out in the full arc. It does not even come out of this, of the, by the arc because the slab is so hot. Conversely, in the Tonga, you do have carbon coming in, but nothing comes out. It's basically, everything is stable and it goes to the transition zone. In, middle, in the middle, you have Nicaragua here. In blue, most of the carbon comes out under the arc. So we have now a picture of the heterogeneity of the subduction efficiency. I told you it's a parameter in most models. Here you see it's far from being a parameter. It's actually a variable, in space at least. You can see that for those hot systems, the subduction efficiency is close to zero. Most of the carbon comes out early. In cold systems, the subduction efficiency is greater than 90%. So most of the carbon goes down uh, to the transition zone. The other implication is that in hot subduction zones, most of the carbon comes out as fluids. In cold subduction zones, most of the carbon should melt deeper. So that's kind of a paradox. When subduction zones are hot, are cold, there's a, a greater likelihood that carbon will leave the slab as a melt deeper beyond the arcs. So that's a very important conclusion. And this is a global compilation. Now we have taken the entire range of subduction zone. We have compiled how much carbon comes out, integrated over the entire range, and we get a sigma. And our sigma is 50, 60, which is amazing because that's actually the number that has been used for decades. So we could be uh, sad right? <laughs> we could imagine that we would have liked to find another number. But we think it's reassuring because now we have actually knowledge about the controls, and that's the key. Because now we know why we get this number, and we know what are the controlling factors. The controlling factors are the thermal structure of the slab and the hydration structure of the slabs. 
It's not how much water there is in the slab, it's where the water is. That's absolutely critical. If the water is in the top part of the slabs, it will tend to get out of the slab early and drive a fast carbon cycle. So sigma is not a parameter. It changes in space, obviously, and in time, because the, this subduction efficiency is actually linked to the fact that we have a lot of biogenic carbonate subducting, which did not exist before the Mesozoic. So we know that there probably were changes in how efficient carbon subduction was in the past. We have geographic patterns. The Eastern Pacific is a carbonate incinerator. Okay, you burn fast uh, the carbonates because it's hot. The Western Pacific is a carbonate shuttle to the deep, uh, to the transition zone. So this is a geographical heterogeneity which, are, which is absolutely fascinating. There are limitations, obviously, because here we consider only fluids. We need to consider partial melting. We need better composition activity models for melts. And for now, the state of the art, we are unable to predict how melts will transport carbon. We do have models, but they are not well calibrated. So we can produce numbers, but they don't mean anything. Pathway of fluid flow. I told you we have the most simple vertical transport of fluid. Obviously, in the field, you never see that fluids advect in very complex ways. So in any models, we need to better handle the geometry of fluid flow, and we need to inform it by field of observations. And there are also large compositional heterogeneities um, in the slabs. So now I want to transition to my most recent uh, work with two students. It is also linked to the reactivity of the lithosphere, but not in the deep earth at the surface. Again, with this idea of understanding the range of reactions that link the lithosphere to atmospheres. The process is the export of organic carbon from continents to the oceans. This export is important because carbon can react with oxygen. It can be a source of CO2. Carbon can be eaten by uh, uh, heterotrophs. Carbon can actually Reprecipitate. So there are a lot of processes that can happen, and all of this will control atmospheric composition. It's we, we know traditionally that lithospheric weathering can act as a net sink of CO2. I told you this is silicate weathering. This is a sink of CO2. We'll ask the CO2, give carbonate in the ocean, first quartz. So this is, since Berner works, this is the classical sink of atmospheric CO2. But what people tend to forget is that lithospheric weathering can actually serve as a source of CO2 and as a sink of oxygen. And there's actually very poor quantification of that flux. And the reaction is the reaction of carbon organic petrogenic from rocks, graphite, bitumens, etc., with oxygen, and it forms CO2. There's, this is, in my opinion, from all the flux in the carbon cycle, probably one of the least quantified and we don't even have a technique to quantify it. So I can't say a word about it. And here is Lena Merki, and she, she, we are working in the Himalayas, measuring in, in the Narayani River the diversity of organic material to try to understand the fate of those materials produced by rocks and released in the environment and how it reacts. Petrogenic carbon are exposed to oxygen everywhere. There's a structural and kinetic diversity of organic materials. In, a wide range of environment. Here I show a piece of rock from Peru. You have, it's a shale, and you see at the interface, exposed to the atmosphere, it's yellow. It has been oxidized. So the carbon that was in the rock reacted with oxygen, and it released CO2. That's important, and we don't have even a quantification for this. This is a picture of the Narayani River, full of carbon coming from rocks of the Himalayas. It transports rocks. It, you have erosion, and it transports it. What does it become? How does it react? This is a picture I took on a, on a beach in Portugal. Beautiful shales as well. The maturation is a bit higher, so the peak temperature is 300 degrees, so the carbon is a little bit more refractory. This is an image of catagnolate. We went, we went there to sample. It's uh, sulfidic sediments, so the, the organic carbon is actually full of sulfur, and so we sampled the sediments there. And the goal here was to make a census of carbon ge geodiversity, to know the whole range of structure and of reactivity of petrogenic carbon, so carbon coming from rocks, how it reacts with the atmosphere. Here is a series of Raman spectra showing the structural diversity of the material. The objective is to basically link the composition of organic carbon 
with the kinetics of its oxidation to the source. Can we use, for example, different techniques to trace the source? Is it biological or is it petrogenic, the organic carbon? And we want to build new ways to predict organic carbon weathering at the global scale. For example, one technique that has been proposed was to measure rhenium and vanadium flux in rivers because rhenium is associated to organic carbon. So if you measure rhenium in the river, you basically have a means to reconstruct how much organic carbon has been oxidized. But we have no clue how rhenium partitions between organic carbon and a fluid or rock at high temperature. But we know that the organic carbon evolves, right? It transforms. So we need quantifications. And so there's a second goal in the group to basically build new techniques to quantify organic carbon weathering and oxidation in this way. In most climate model, this entire process, carbon weathering is described by one rate constant, K. It's one single rate constant, and it's the same thing. We, we go back in time in the Phanerozoic, we consider it a parameter. Well, you can see that if you have diversity of material, you have a diversity of kinetics. It's not simple. So it's, again, trying to dig into the physics. So how we get an idea about kinetics? Well, the best technique is called thermogravimetry. And what we can do is to basically burn a material. And we weigh the material very precisely. What you get is basically a rate of mass loss. You know the temperature of your ramp. So you heat uh, in a ramp. And with these two input, with an assumption on the Arrhenius prefactor, you get an activation energy for the reaction. So this is a TGA at ETH. This is the basic principle. And this is what we have done with all of those type of materials that I told you, and I, we are still working on it. So Emile Lehmann, for example, he worked on low-grade materials. So we have here, it's a, it's a plot showing the different uh, population of activation energy within a sample. You can see here the activation energy of this sample, the main population is at 150 kilo, kilojoule per mole. Here you have metamorphic graphite, the Portuguese one. You see they come out at 250 kilojoule per mole. And epigenetic graphite from New Hampshire, which are close to the heart of the grumble, so those are around 300 kilojoule per mole. You see it's a very large spread. All of this is petrogenic. If you, do, if you burn a biological material, they will come out at 150. So what we were very surprised to see is that actually petrogenic material are not clustering at 300. They are all across the range. Petrogenic carbon contain things that are very reactive and things that are uh, refractory. And here we have also burned pet uh, particulate organic carbon from the Himalayas. And it was fascinating. This is what we found. You see you have a distribution that covers the entire range of end members that we found in rocks. So the Nar Narayani River basically contains the entire range of organic material that is flow through the Indian Himalayas. And this is the work of Lena Merki. So we found a diversity of petrogenic material in Narayani River, and we try to link it with changes, geomorphic change, climatic change, etc. And this uh, study, part of this study at least, will be published uh, in a month in Nature Geoscience. So it's a big review about the organic carbon cycle. <coughs> so this is now my conclusion on the link between reactivity of the lithosphere and carbon cycle. So from an atmospheric point of view, what does geodynamic do? It produces a diversity of organic carbon that would not be accessible without tectonics. So basically, biology produces very reactive materials. It would never graphitize. It would never transform. Geodynamics changes the material and it produces a, a range of organic material with very specific oxidation kinetics. And they participate to fluctuations of oxygen and CO2 over time. And obviously, it regulates the cyclicity of climate and PO2. We have heterogeneities at all scale. When we consider parameters in climate model, be skeptical. It, should not, it may not be a parameter. The subduction efficiency is not a parameter. It's a variable, at least in space, and very probably time. And we don't need to go to the great oxygenation event to find some uh, interesting stuff. Probably before the Mesozoic, this subduction uh, efficiency was already almost null. right? And so let's come back to Earth. What is Earth? What is the recipe for a habitable planet? A thermostat first. And I told you that this is probably linked to the fact that Earth is an exceptional 
planet to keep carbon in rocks. It's not the atmosphere that matters, it's actually the rock that matters here. We need active tectonics, which allows to store carbon. The longevity of the carbon cycle is linked to the presence of water, which, we, which I propose is probably linked also to the presence of oxygen, because if there was no oxygen, water would, would have uh, been lost through space. So there's pr probably a link between the longevity of the carbon cycle and the presence of life on Earth. Everything is intertwined. But the question that I think is the most important for us obviously beyond the science, is to ask how to maintain a habitable, habitable planet for everyone. It's not just about finding other habitable planets. We have only one that we know of, and we are kind of screwing it up. So I think this is also a fundamental question, and it's not just a question for politicians. I think we have to uh, contribute to the, the, the debate, give our own definition of Earth, and what makes it worth to preserve. So in a way, in my Brankovice Fellowship, to, to close on this, I'm trying to do my research, but to place it in a context that allows to think more about the worth of this planet and, and why it, it matters to, uh, to us. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, the funding is through the Branko Weiss Fellowship. And thank you many colleagues in Carnegie, in Paris, in ETH, the students and alumni of, of my uh, physical geobiology group at ETH. And uh, yeah, the group is expanding. So thank you very much, and I, I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah.